It's great to welcome to the program today Fabrizio Benedetti, who is joining us from Italy. He is professor of physiology and neuroscience at the University of Turin Medical School. Um, and we are going to talk about the placebo effect. So I think a, a good place to start, Professor, is I think a lot of people don't even understand what we mean when we say the placebo effect. So let's start there. What is this phenomenon known as the placebo effect? Uh, yes, indeed, there is a, there is a lot of uh, confusion about uh, these words, uh, placebo on the one hand uh, and the placebo response or placebo effect on the other. And uh, mm, usually placebo is defined as uh, uh, inert substance, inert treatment with no therapeutic properties. And uh, the placebo response is the response uh, after placebo administration. Uh, so the main confusion is that uh, usually the focus of attention is uh, on the uh, placebo itself uh, because a placebo is the uh, uh, inert treatment. But uh, uh, I mean, what we have learned over the past few years is that uh, when we studied a placebo effect, actually we studied the psychosocial context around the therapy, around the, uh, the patient. Uh, so, uh, when we talk about placebo, placebo is the inert treatment uh, with no therapeutic properties and the psychosocial context around the patient. So, when we want to, for example, when we give uh, a placebo, actually what we do is a simulation of a therapy. It's a fake therapy. In this way, we can eliminate the specific effect of the therapy, for example, the specific effect of a drug, and we can uh, study the psychological component. It would be better to say the psychosocial component, because, you know, in the psychosocial context, there are so many uh, stimuli, social stimuli, sensory stimuli, which tell the patients now there will be an improvement in your condition, in your medical condition. So I would say that the best definition of a placebo is that a placebo is uh, the psychosocial context, which means the psychosocial component of any therapy, be it pharmacological or not, of course. And, and this is very relevant to people's everyday lives, uh, arguably in more ways than the average person is sort of aware of. I mean, a common one is you'll see a commercial for some pharmaceutical and it will make a claim like, for example, 60% uh, of patients had improved sy symptoms when taking this medication. And, and very often in very small print along the bottom of the TV screen, you will see something that says, as compared to 50% improvement for patients receiving a placebo. And that is a very different scenario, an, a drug that is only marginally more effective than the placebo than something that is 60 percentage points more effective than than no treatment. That's one example, right, with pharmaceuticals. But in what other areas of life is placebo relevant? Uh, well, you, you, you talk about uh, about a clinical trial setting uh, for, for drug companies. Of course, a placebo is uh, is a very important topic uh, because uh, when you want to validate a new treatment, a new, a, new a new therapy, actually you have to compare the new treatment with uh, a, a fake treatment, with a placebo. Uh, uh, the other areas in everyday life is uh, routine medical practice, of course. In routine medical practice, uh, there are so many uh, placebos, uh, and uh, there is another area of everyday life, which is sport. And when we talk about uh, clinical practice, uh, we, we, we can... Uh, we can talk about uh, pain reduction or a reduction on any other symptoms like motor performance in Parkinson's disease. But uh, when we talk about sport and uh, physical performance, uh, it is not surprising actually that you can improve uh, uh, performance, physical performance in the setting of different sports uh, by using a placebo, which means uh, if you change the psychosocial context around an athlete, for example, you can improve his or her uh, 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 physical performance. So there are many settings. I would say that uh, uh, today we are uh, 
uh, today we are working on the three different settings. The first setting is the clinical trial setting, which is quite important for drug companies. Well, actually, not only drug companies, of course, but any clinical trial is. Um, the second setting is a routine medical practice, and the third setting is a physical performance and sport. There is sometimes a misunderstanding that if a placebo works to improve some condition or to reduce some symptom, that the symptom or the cause of that symptom must have been psychosomatic to begin with. Is that an accurate assessment or is that mistaken? It's only partially true, actually, because uh, it's partially true because uh, it is true uh, that whenever the psychological component is important in uh, a medical condition like anxiety, like depression, like motor performance in Parkinson's disease, I mean, the, 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 the psychological component is very important in motor performance, like pain, you know, so anxiety, depression, uh, pain, uh, motor performance, uh, it is true. Psychological component is really very important. So placebos work whenever the psychological component is important. But uh, it is partially true, your assertion, because, uh, because uh, we know that there are uh, many other mechanisms in uh, uh, placebo responsiveness. For example, we know that there are some unconscious placebo responses. Uh, which works for the immune system. And in the immune system, the psychological component is very small, if any. So, I mean, uh, if, uh, if we want to discuss different mechanisms of the placebo response, we have to separate, for example, anxiety or Parkinson's disease from the immune system. You know, uh, the main point, I think uh, this is a very important point, is that as far as we know today, there is not a single placebo response. Actually, there are many placebo responses across different medical conditions and uh, across uh, uh, different therapeutic interventions. So if you ask me, usually people ask me, uh, what is the mechanism of the placebo response? This is the wrong question. The correct question is, what are the mechanisms, the plural, across different medical conditions? Uh, so uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, um, your statement is partially true. Uh, some mechanisms involve uh, expectations, which means the psychological component. Some other mechanisms uh, don't involve uh, a psychological component at, at all because everything is unconscious. It is outside our, uh, our uh, you know, uh, awareness, our consciousness. How does that apply to, there's a, a study I read about, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, where um, there were a, a number of patients who were identified as needing a surgery to execute a, a physical repair. I don't remember if it was a knee or a back related repair that was going to be done. And every patient experienced the sort of pre-surgical process of getting ready for surgery. Every patient had an incision done while under general anesthesia. But some patients after the incision were immediately sewn back up and no repair was actually made, whereas other patients had the actual surgery. And it was determined that the patients who were prepped for surgery, had an incision done, were anesthetized, but no repair was executed, showed a significant improvement uh, uh, comparable to that of those patients who actually had the physical repair done. How can we understand that placebo response? Is it the expectation that they would feel better after a surgery was done? Uh, well, uh, it's very important to emphasize that in those studies, uh, uh, the, study, the studies you are mentioned, mentioning um, about surgery, for example, a surgery uh, is very difficult to see what is going on. Uh, in the patients uh, after fake surgery or real surgery, uh, because uh, uh, those studies uh, with fake surgery, with placebo surgery, uh, uh, you can't really rule out uh, the possibility of a spontaneous remission. Mm. There are no appropriate control groups. For example, there are no what we call uh, no treatment group or natural history group or waiting list group, you know, in which there is no treatment. 
no surgery, for example. So in those studies, in those surgery studies, there is no appropriate control group. So actually, actually, I am pretty skeptical because uh, because uh, that could be, and you can't really uh, uh, rule out the possibility of spontaneous remission. So, um, so to uh, and just to make sure that that's clear to the audience, um, there are lots of conditions that resolve on their own is what you're sort of getting at. And when we compare a treatment to a placebo, you also sort of really need a group that has no treatment at all, because you do need to account for the fact that there are many conditions and symptoms that would go away without any treatment whatsoever. That's correct. You are perfectly right. Absolutely. Uh, the main problem is that uh, if you want uh, if you want to understand the placebo response, you need to compare two groups. The first group is a group with no treatment. Just no treatment group is used for uh, uh, assessing a spontaneous remission, the spontaneous time course of a symptom or a disease, you know, over time. Uh, and the second group, a second group uh, receives a placebo. So the difference between uh, the no treatment group and the placebo group is the, the real placebo response, which means the real psychological effect. If you don't have a spontaneous remission group, a natural history group, or if you prefer to call it uh, a no treatment group, it is not really possible to rule out uh, spontaneous remission, the natural history of the, of the disease. So in surgery, unfortunately, we don't have no treatment groups. Mm. So it is also possible after surgery, after fake surgery, after, I mean, placebo surgery, it is possible that there was a spontaneous remission. It was not a real psychological effect. It was not a real uh, placebo effect. So, I mean, the, 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 the topic is quite complex, you know, but uh, the main point is that uh, there is a real psychological effect and it is the real placebo effect. There is a fake placebo effect and it is not a real psychological effect. It is a, a spontaneous remission. Uh, how, if at all, does the reality of the placebo response impact sort of the business of the pharmaceutical industry. And I guess what I mean by that is um, if we concede that there are many cases in which a patient would benefit this, to the same degree or almost the same degree from a placebo treatment as they would from a presumably more expensive uh, real treatment, for lack of a better term, is that not a threat to the pharmaceutical industry to some degree? Uh, yes. Well, I, I can say, by the way, that drug companies are very, very much interested in placebo research for two reasons. Yeah. The first reason, the first reason is that they would like to develop new uh, uh, designs for clinical trials, of course, because some designs today are not really satisfactory for answering answering many, many questions. You know, the second reason is that the drug companies would like to predict in advance, who is good placebo responder, who is not. Mm. Uh, so um, uh, drug companies are very, very much interested in, uh, in, uh, in placebo research. And uh, sometimes, as you said, uh, uh, there is uh, no difference between the uh, uh, response to a real drug, to a real treatment, and uh, to, uh, to a placebo. Uh, that would be a very, very interesting for uh, for drug companies from uh, a practical point of view as well, because uh, just consider a condition in which there is no difference between a placebo and a drug. So uh, is it possible to really use uh, in clinical practice, I mean, not in the clinical trial setting, but in clinical practice, is it really possible to use uh, a placebo in place of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a real drug? Uh, many say yes, many, many people say no for ethical uh, uh, limitations, of course, for ethical reasons. I've thought about that quite a bit because if we take for a second sort of the group of conditions that um, sometimes are psychosomatic conditions or conditions related to um, an emotional situation in someone's life, so insomnia, for example, or headaches of no determined origin, uh, you can imagine, you know, sort of what other conditions would be on that list. 
it's very clear that many of the individuals suffering from that would improve merely by being told, here's a pill that will help you. And it seems to me that there's a real opportunity there to have people improve with a with a placebo pill, a pill that would have no side effects by virtue of not really having active ingredients. But what are the ethics of that? In other words, it would only work if the patient doesn't know that it's a fake pill. And that would raise ethical questions about the prescriber, would it not? Yeah, absolutely. You are right. Uh, it is possible to use a placebo pill to use uh, a fake pill in routine medical practice. Uh, um, uh, you can give uh, you can give uh, not so much uh, a fake pill, which means uh, you can give instead of a sugar pill or uh, instead of giving uh, a glass of fresh water, you can give, uh, a very very small dose of a real drug. For example, just imagine a situation in which you give morphine. Uh, an effective dose of morphine is uh, uh, more or less uh, 10 milligrams. You know, that's the effective dose of morphine. But you can, uh, just, to, just to overcome the ethical problem, you can give uh, a very, very small dose, not 10 milligrams, but just one milligram, for example. And uh, uh, one milligram is actually a placebo uh, because uh, uh, there is not, uh, uh, there is not, uh, a dose, pharmacological dose, which uh, can be really effective uh, to reduce pain. So if you reduce the dose from 10 milligrams to one milligram uh, and you increase uh, the patient's expectations, uh, actually you can overcome the ethical problem, which means that uh, actually you don't give a sugar pill, but you give a very, very, very small dose of a drug. Last thing I want to touch on, um, what other areas in society uh, might be um, might benefit from explorations of the placebo response outside of the sort of medical settings you and I have mostly been discussing? Uh, in, I, I would say in everyday life, just to give you an example, I live in an area here in northern Italy where there is a very good wine. And if you come to Italy, to my area, and you taste wine, and they tell you it is Italian wine, probably it tastes much better <laughs> is really very very good wine even though it is not real italian wine but uh, i don't know uh, wine from any other country for example so your expectation i mean uh, works in everyday life not only in the clinical setting uh, but for uh, in uh, for food uh, for uh, you know drinks uh, for wine uh, and for uh, dresses as well for example uh, the stylist, you know, work uh, very much on this aspect, expectations about uh, about style. Another example, well, I, I live in Italy, of course, so for fashion. Fashion, Italian fashion uh, is uh, quite uh, important, famous all over the world. And if I tell you this is an Italian dress, uh, probably you expect a very, very good uh, uh, dress. So in conclusion, I mean, uh, we we found we, we find that uh, uh, a placebo, or if you prefer, probably it is not correct to call it a placebo. We can call expectation. The expectations are very very important in everyday life. Yeah, the the wine placebo studies, wine expectation studies that have been done are actually very very interesting. Uh, we've been speaking uh, with Professor of Physiology and Neuroscience, Fabrizio Benedetti, who's joining us from Northern Italy today. Thanks, thank you so much for talking to me about this. Thank you very much.